Well, good evening to everyone. It's a packed house, to be sure. Uh, my name's John Highbush. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. And I just want to start by thanking everyone for coming out this evening. In honor of our men and women in uniform who protect our freedom around the world, if you would please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, it is definitely a pleasure and an honor to welcome Karl Rove back to the Reagan Library. I'd like to start by also welcoming Carl's wife, Karen, who is here with us tonight. Karen, thank you for coming. <laughs> We'd like you to consider yourself at home here, Carl, uh, not only for the many kind words that I know you've spoken over the years for President Reagan. Um, as stewards of President Reagan's legacy, we certainly appreciate that. But there is also a deep admiration here for your service to our nation during the oft uh, tough and critical times of the Bush presidency. At that time, we know that you helped to lead this nation both behind the scenes and at the forefront of political combat for years when it was really important, more important than ever, to simply do the right thing, not the politically correct thing, every single day when you went to work. We all find ways to serve, I know. So on behalf of everyone here, thank you, Carl, for your service to this country. When Carl was last here, uh, 2010, he brought with him his life story in the form of a New York Times best-selling book called Courage and Consequence. I said at that time that he was smart, a political genius, talented, one of the most influential and effective political strategists in America. And I noted correctly at the time that it would be difficult to find another figure in the Bush White House or anywhere else in government at the time with greater influence than Carl. I also spoke of one of his most important traits, both to his boss, President Bush, and to his country. And that trait was loyalty. All those words to describe Carl then remain as true as ever. But today, Carl comes to us in his role of author and educator and historian. Everyone here knows that 2015 and 2016 have already proven to be some of the most interesting years from an election standpoint that any of us can remember. <laughs> now enter Carl Rove and his insights on President William McKinley. Now that's interesting. McKinley, you say. How could a time and a presidential race of well over 100 years ago bring insight to the political turmoil within the Republican Party and our nation today? Well, I'll leave it to Carl to cover that, but suffice it to say that in his book, The Triumph of William McKinley, Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters, it becomes obvious that the political environment the changing electorate, income disparity, the issue of immigration, the economy, and rapidly advancing technology of our time all played a role in the changing face of American politics for many years at that time. Carl sees important parallels between those days and our own tumultuous times as we look forward to this year, 2016. His book is a fascinating read, and it's one that I hope that you'll pick up on your way out this evening as you go through our store. I know that Carl is more than willing to sign a book for you as well as, well as say hello to you as well. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming to the Reagan Library, Mr. Carl Rove.
Uh, thank you, John, for that incredibly generous uh, introduction. Um, I've been to the library a number of times, uh, the most important of which was the day of the president's internment when I uh, was here with President Bush 43, and uh, quite a day. And uh, I met President Reagan when I was 25 years old, and uh, like you, I suspect, were blown away by his personality and his charisma. And uh, I met a man not too long ago who, in Philadelphia who told me, he said, one of the proudest days of my life was the day I married my wife and the day that I voted for Ronald Reagan the first time. <laughs> I said, I hope you haven't told your wife that. <laughs> but um, it's great to be here. Really excited to see the uh, Air Force One. You're welcome. <laughs> so I get this phone call from an agent of Nancy Reagan. I'm sitting in the West Wing of the White House, and the, the message says that uh, the messenger says, uh, Mrs. Reagan would like to have Air Force One for the Reagan Library. It's sitting in Dover, uh, Delaware, and the Air Force refuses to give it to her. What can you do to help us? <laughs> so Odd request, I went into the Oval Office and said, Mr. President, uh, Nancy Reagan wants uh, Air Force One. I've checked it out and the Air Force wants to hold on to it. They're making a lot of excuses, but their real purpose I've divined is to take it to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and put it in the Air Force Museum there. What should we do? And he looked over his glasses and said, Mrs. Reagan wants it, Mrs. Reagan gets it. <laughs> so. So I, so I got the job of calling the Air Force and telling them they couldn't steal the airplane. <laughs> they weren't too happy with me for a while afterwards. But uh, anyway, John uh, touched on the book a little bit, and uh, he's absolutely right. I didn't set out to write a book about the 1896 election because of the parallels with 2016. I set out to write the history of a largely forgotten president in one of the most consequential and important elections in American history. Political scientists have studied the five great realigning elections in American history, times at which politics was one way before an election and for some substantial period of time afterwards was significantly different. The election of 1800, which, which was the movement from the Federalists under George Washington to the Democratic Republicans under Thomas Jefferson. That era lasted until 1828 with with Andrew Jackson and the rise of the Democratic Party, which was replaced in 1860 by a new political system heralded by the election of Abraham Lincoln, the emergence of the Republicans, and 1932 with FDR and the New Deal. The other great realigning election is 1896, and yet we spend more time talking about the guy who lost the election, William Jennings Bryan, and the guy who comes next, Theodore Roosevelt, than we talk about the man who brought about a fundamental realignment in American politics in an era that turns out to look dramatically like today. The politics of the Gilded Age was broken. For the 24 years leading into the 1896 presidential election, in five consecutive presidential elections, no one received 50% of the vote. We had two presidents elected with a majority in the Electoral College and a minority of the popular vote. We had a third president elected with a majority in the Electoral College and a popular vote majority nationwide of 7,000 votes. In 24 years, we had divided government for 20 years with the White House, the House, and Senate held by different parties. We had two years in which the Republicans ran, the, ran it all, White House, House, and Senate, and two years in which the Democrats ran it all, House, White House, and Senate. And for 20 years, we had dysfunctional gridlock government, divided government. And if you think divided government is bad today with gridlock, go back to then. It makes it look like they're all sitting around the campfire singing Kumbaya. <laughs> 1890, the Republicans take control of the House. They, uh, uh, they, they are sworn in in March of 1891, and then uh, uh, begin to, back then they, 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 were, they were civilized. They didn't make them meet in Washington during the summer. They began the session in the fall. And on the first day of the, 
of the congressional session, the House Democrats announced they will use a parliamentary maneuver to deny the House of Representatives the opportunity to consider a single bill. This isn't cut shutting down the government. This is simply saying you can't even take up a bill to consider. And they do this by refusing to answer the roll call. The Speaker of the House goes for a few days with this problem, with calling the roll and lacking a quorum because the Democrats answering the, aren't answering the roll call. And at the end of this uh, several days, Thomas Brackett Reed, the Speaker of the House, six foot three inches tall, looks like a bowling pin with a walrus mustache pa pasted, uh, uh, pasted on him. He uh, directs the clerk at the end of the roll call when they don't have a quorum. He says, I direct the clerk to call Mr. to show Mr. Jones president, Mr. Smith president, Mr. Fall president, Mr. Winter president. A Democrat stands up on the floor and says, under God and the Constitution, you have no right to count me present. <laughs> to which Reed says, very coolly, the chairman of the chair is merely stating the fact, does the honorable gentleman from Kentucky deny he's present on the floor of the House? And that kicks off a three-month-long battle to confirm whether or not the speaker has a right to do that. The first day of the debate, William Henry Howdy Martin stands up. Six foot six inches tall, thin as a rail, mean as a snake, congressman from East Texas. Fought the entire Civil War in Hood's Brigade. He got his nickname when Robert E. Lee reviewed Hood's Brigade. And as he was riding by the officers in charge of the unit, Howdy Martin stood up in his stirrups, took off his hat, waved it at Lee and said, Howdy. <laughs> Martin stands up on the floor of the house and says, pointing at Reed, he says, if any member will order me to remove this dictator, from his position on the podium, I will do so by force, forthwith. Reed says, the honorable gentleman from Texas is out of order and moves on. Martin is so irritated, he starts showing up every day at the beginning of the House debate, sitting right in front of the podium, pulls out his 16-inch long Bowie knife and methodically stokes it against his heel to sharpen it to, to uh, menace Reed. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, I do not remember this happening in 2011 with Nancy Pelosi losing power. I don't. But this is how broken politics was in the era. There were two gigantic issues that had arisen. Protective tariffs and the question of what constituted money in America. Was it paper? Was it gold? Was it silver? And these issues are esoteric to us today hard for us to understand, but they brought about a passion in politics that is hard to ignore. Turnout in the North generally reached 80% of the vote. In a country less well-educated and less affluent than we are today, eight out of every 10 adult males turned out to vote. And people felt passionately about these issues. Now, part of the reason they felt passionately about the issue, these issues is because the country was undergoing enormous changes that people found difficult to comprehend. We were undergoing a demographic change. We were a nation of immigrants. But be up till the 1860s and 1870s and early 1880s, our immigration was coming from familiar places. England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Germany. But starting in the 1870s and 1880s, it began to accelerate from other places. We had Ukrainian wheat farmers. We had Polish tailors. We had Italian potters. We had Spanish tanners. We had Scandinavians of all things, these strange people from Norway, Sweden, and Finland. I say that as a proud Norwegian. <laughs> but this was unsettling the country because these people did not have a connection to the American experience as, as most Americans had. They had not been here in the Civil War. They had not going th gone through this searing conflict that divided the country bitterly and established the political lines in the country. You vote, you voted as you fought. If you were a Southerner, you were a Democrat. If you were a Northerner and had sympathized with the cause to keep the Union uh, together and to ultimately end slavery, you were a Republican. And if you were a Northerner with Southern sympathies, you were a Democrat. And these people didn't have any connection to the political system like that. The economy was being disrupted by enormous technology and technological change that most people found hard to deal with. The electric light bulb, electric engines, rail, 
refrigerated rail cars. We had two guys, a failed uh, candlestick maker and a failed uh, soap maker in Cincinnati, Ohio, get together and say we ought to figure out how we can deliver consumer goods to Americans cheaper and, uh, cheaper and better. You may remember their names, Mr. Proctor and Mr. Gamble. And this change, I mean, we were a nation of where people were literally asking, is there a place for me in the future of this economy? I'm an artisan, and now I have to compete with an industrial plant. I made something, and now a machine makes it with a regularity that I can't keep up with. I'm a farmer, and I was able to provide for my family, but now I, I no longer, when I take my grain to the to, 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 to a market, I no longer have to worry about the price in the next county. I got to worry about the price in the Ukraine or the price in Australia or the price in Argentina because now I, I have to live in a world uh, agricultural uh, uh, economy. And these things were causing enormous concerns about whether there was a, whether I was getting my fair shake of what, of what this American economy was producing. There was concern about the gigantic gap between the rich and the poor about the power of the money power on, on Wall Street. And since we were a developing country, there was an animosity towards those foreigners whom we needed to get money from in order to invest in our economy. Think of the United States in the 1880s and 90s as Brazil or India needing, needing investment from the, 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 uh, the, the Democrats in 1896 referred to them as the Shylocks of of Lombard Street, the, London's Wall Street, or, or, the, or the, bond, the money grabbers of the Rothschilds, the, the French uh, financial uh, family. So all of these things had conspired to make a politics in 1896 that is really remarkable. And it's, it's, it's an amazing story. I, I, I studied it as a political scientist. In this book, I've tried to write about it from the perspective of being inside the cockpit of these two campaigns, the Democratic campaign and the Republican campaign, and chart the things that happen in a campaign, not because of the impersonal forces of history or culture or the economy, but, be, but how those things interact with the actions of normal, ordinary human beings. And as a result, it is a wild tale. It's full of sex and violence, and backstabbing, and betrayal, and deception, and fraud, amazing courage, unbelievable compassion, and really cool nicknames. <laughs> Every political figure of the time had a nickname. The Republican nominee is the Napoleon of protection. The Democratic nominee is the boy orator of the Platte. The bad guys on the Republican side call themselves the Combine and write each other coded letters. And they're led by the easy boss, Senator Thomas Collier Platt of New York, who's aided by Matthew S. Quay, the only guy I can find who doesn't have a nickname. <laughs> and they're, they're, the, the, the Republican front runner, uh, Senator, uh, 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 Speaker Thomas Brackett Reed, is aided by a couple of young men, Henry Cabot Lodge of, of Massachusetts and the failed New York police commissioner, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who's lost the race for the mayorship of New York by coming in third. And the front runner for the Democratic nomination has my favorite nickname of all, Congressman Richard Park Bland of Missouri. For 30 years, nearly 30 years, he has led the fight for the free and unlimited coinage of silver, a cause he says is that of humanity itself, and his nickname is Silver Dick. <laughs> and it's an amazing tale, full of people that you have never heard of, and everything you think you know about the race, it turns out to be wrong. You think McKinley is the puppet of Marcus Alonzo Hanna, Mark Hanna, the ironmonger and, and a grocer and coal magnate from, from uh, Cleveland. But no, he turns out to be the friend of William McKinley. Think about him as a member of one of Ronald Reagan's uh, kitchen cabinets. Think about him as Holmes Tuttle or one of the many people who surrounded Ronald Reagan who were his friends, who said, we believe in this man and we want to help him. They, they were not the masters of Reagan. Reagan was their master. And similarly, Mark Hanna was the, was the servant of, of William McKinley. In fact, 
uh, one of their friends, one of McKinley's and Hannah's friends was a Swedish baker in, in Chicago named Herman Colsat, who later uh, made so much money started buying newspapers. And he once said the attitude of Mark Hanna towards William McKinley was like that of a bashful boy towards the girl he loves. And it was Hannah who uh, repeated that uh, phrase uh, to people to, to, with a great laugh and a chuckle because he knew it was absolutely true. The actual campaign manager of William McKinley in the 1896 campaign was 29 years old in 1894 when McKinley met him. Tall kid, red hair, parted in the middle, scrawny kid, grew up in, in Ohio, went to the University of Cincinnati Law School, and then, like a lot of people, headed west to make his living and showed up in Lincoln, Nebraska, practice in law. He's a young guy and uh, pretty smart. And uh, he practiced law in a small office building in Lincoln, Nebraska, and became friends with another young lawyer in the small building, five years his senior, and the two of them joined a men's reading club and debate society called the uh, Round Table. And they used to have lunch with another pal at Cameron's Diner. The young lawyer was William Jennings Bryan. And the other pal that they would have lunch with was the ROTC instructor at the University of Nebraska, a young West Pointer named John J. Pershing. McKinley meets the kid when the kid comes to Columbus, Ohio, and says to him, if you run for president, I want to help you. And McKinley sees him again in October of 1894 when he's barnstorming on during the midterm elections and runs into the kid in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And the kid says, I've made some contacts for you in Wyoming and the Dakotas, and I'm ready to organize Nebraska for you. And McKinley says, this kid's got a lot. The kid moves to Chicago in January of 1895 to become an entrepreneur. This is the most important contest in the Republican presidential sweepstakes, Illinois. One of McKinley's advisors says, it is the Gettysburg of the contest. The Republican machine in Cook County is led by the blonde boss, Congressman William J. Larmer. In 1884, he's a streetcar conductor who is dissatisfied with the quality of the Republican organization in his ward in the city of Chicago. He's 22 years old. Two years later, he has organized the second ward of Chicago and changed it from a Democratic to a Republican stronghold by organizing all the young men and all the young workers in the ward and is rewarded with a seat on the Cook County Republican Central Committee. Two years later, at the age of 26, he's given a job in the Water Department. Two years after that, he's paid, made the head of the Water Department of Cook County and the city of Chicago with 1,300 patronage workers underneath him. And two years after that, gets himself elected to Congress and becomes the undisputed boss of the Cook County Republican machine. And, uh, and he is not for McKinley. He's now 34 years old by the time of the election, and he is thrown in with the, with the chairman of the state Republican Party, the boss of the downstate Republicans, John Riley Tanner, and the two of them say, we're going to pick out a, a favorite son candidate, uh, Senator Shelby Cullum, Uncle Shelby, and we'll, we'll be united behind him. He has no chance of getting elected, and then we will sell the, the votes of the third largest delegation at the Republican National Convention to the bosses in return for certain considerations, patronage and money. And uh, along comes McKinley who says, you know what, I'm going to run against the bosses. And what does he do? He picks the now 30-year-old kid to be the head of his campaign in the state. And the, and the blonde boss and Tanner say, we've seen jerks like this before. We run over, we run over novices like this. But the young 30-year-old begins every day to build a card file at his office at the Auditorium Hotel that shows to him where every one of the county delegates in all 102 counties stands so that he can direct the three men who work for him, two of whom are 30 years his senior, Civil War generals, two Civil War generals who, have no, who know the inside out of Illinois politics, but they, be, they are so taken by the kid's energy smarts, enthusiasm, and organization that they take to calling him the general. <laughs> and on the night that McKinley, uh, on the night of the uh, Illinois Convention, McKinley is astounded to receive the news that his man, who's now about to turn 31, has dealt the machine a, a defeat like nobody has ever seen, defeating them by two to one 
at the state convention in Illinois and thereby ending the Republican contest for the presidency. And that night, McKinley sits down and writes him a letter and says, nothing in this long contest is so important and so signal as the triumph at Springfield. You have shown extraordinary leadership. You have won extraordinary honor. You long ago won my heart. He's a son that McKinley never has. He then goes on to manage McKinley's general election campaign at the age of 31, a remarkable young man who becomes at the age of 32 under McKinley, the director of the office of the controller of the currency in charge of the entire financial system of America. He goes on to become the first director of the very first Bureau of the Budget under Warren G. Harding, vice president under Calvin Coolidge, ambassador to Great Britain, first head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and the fourth American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. But when McKinley meets him, he's a 29-year-old frontier lawyer with red hair that he parts in the middle. <laughs> Charles G. Dawes. And this story is populated by people like this. But what's the election about? The election is, is about these two esoteric questions. Primarily, what should our money uh, be, can consist of? Should it be a gold-based currency or should it be an inflationary silver currency? And it's hard for us to understand what that means. But in the Cross of Gold speech, William Jennings Bryan explained in a few pithy sentences exactly was it was at the heart of this battle over the gold standard. And I, 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 I'm going to remember them almost exactly right, but excuse me if they're a word or two off, but it, let me repeat them to you and see if you remember having, having heard this once or twice before. He says, Republicans believe that if you legislate for the prosperous, then their prosperity will leak through on those below. Democrats believe that if you, if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, then their prosperity will rise up and through every class that rests upon them. Have you heard that once or twice before? And here we have an election in the middle of a depression in which one party is saying we believe in liberal economic policies. Let us debase the currency so that everybody has more money. Let's give things to people that they, that they get free. And somebody else says, I believe that we ought to stand for the gold standard, which means that we have money that retains its value. And sure, that's the, that's the policy of Wall Street, but there's a reason why we ought to believe in that, and that's because it means that the working man gets a fair day's wage for a fair day's worth of work. And McKinley fights out the election on those, on those grounds, doesn't start out doing it. In July and August, he doesn't want to talk about this issue because he's afraid of it. But by late August, he begins to talk about this issue and by mid-September has found his feet on this issue and makes a case for conservative economic policies and wins the labor man's vote. He's endorsed by the former head of the largest labor union in America, the Knights of Labor, and endorsed by the two current presidents of the two largest railway, railway units in, uh, railroad unions in America. And if you look at the election results, the factory districts of Baltimore, the working class neighborhoods of Chicago, these go for McKinley. He wins the city of New York, and more importantly, the city of Brooklyn, where a lot of the working people live. And it's because he takes a principled stand on behalf of these issues. Anyway, the lessons I think that are in there, I, I outlined the eight of them, but the most important of all is, is that the candidate took on the most important issue of the campaign rather than shy away from it. He wanted to shy away from it, but he had to, he had to talk about it and realized it. And second of all, he talked about it not by straddling the issue, not by walking away from the issue or, or trying to sort of take the rough edges off, but by, to, by shooting straight with the American people in a very principled way about why, why he believed what he believed. And he talked about it in inclusive terms. He painted an optimistic future of the country. While William Jennings Bryan is excoriating the country, he calls the East the enemy's country. He talks, he pit, tries to pit workers against, against labor, against capital, uh, workers against the owners of their companies. Uh, McKinley talks in the language of national unity. We're all in this together. We either rise as a country as one or we don't. And he paints an optimistic and positive vision of the future and brings people together. 
He also modernizes his party. He realizes that the white Anglo-Saxon party of the Republicans in the North can't win elections in a changing America. So he does something that no Republican ever has done before, and that is he carefully cultivates the leadership of the Catholic Church and becomes the first Republican candidate for president who is ever endorsed by a member of the Catholic hierarchy. This is simply unheard of. But in October, when the Bishop of St. Paul, Minnesota, issues an open letter saying, I'm a Catholic, but I'm also an American. I'm a teacher of faith, but I'm also a voter, and I have a right to express my views, and here's why I'm for William McKinley. It is like a lightning bolt and helps bring into the Republican ranks Catholics from Central Europe and Southern Europe that had never felt a part of either political party. He's also, I found out, the first presidential candidate of either party to, in the campaign bef during the primaries, to openly appear in front of black audiences and, op and ask for their vote. And he does so in March of 1895, and of all places, the Deep South. This is simply unheard of. Republicans in the South were black, but they were dealt with at a distance and by agents. And here is William McKinley, literally in Jacksonville, Florida, and then in Savannah, Georgia, openly meeting with black Republicans. In Savannah, he goes to a church and gives a speech in front of the public and asks for their support. Anyway, it's a great story. Uh, I hope you, uh, I, if you like history, uh, I hope you'll like it. And if you just like good gossip, there's a lot in there. <laughs> And if you like interesting characters, it's filled with them. One of my favorite characters is a, is, a, is a Democrat named Burke Cochran. He's not a particularly attractive guy, sort of normal and ordinary. But when he spoke, he, had a, he was born in Ireland. And when he spoke, he had an Irish baritone. And when he spoke, men wanted to be his friend and women wanted to be his lover. <laughs> he was apparently incredibly charismatic. And he was a Tammany Hall man. He was a machine Democrat from, from New York. He, he left Congress in 1894, and he took a lover, a British aristocratic widow. And they, were, they, they had quite an affair. And he spent most of his time in Europe in the arms of his lover. Came back to the United States in October of 1895 because her son, her 19-year-old son, was going to be coming through the United States en route to Cuba. And... Uh, so he hosted the young lad at his apartment in New York for a month and did some law business and then broke his leg and went back to recuperate by taking the steamship to La Havre and going to Paris where his, where his uh, lover was and uh, spent the spring and summer recuperating and then broke off the affair and came back to the United States. And when he came back in August of 1896, he is met at the dockside by the press. He sort of sent word, I got something to say, show up. And he gets off the boat and says, look, I'm a Democrat. I've always been a Democrat. But I'm also an honest money man. I believe in the gold standard. And as a result, I cannot uh, support the silver platform or the silver candidate of Chicago. Now, this is unheard of in the time. This is like, uh, this is like John Conley in 1972 saying, I was Lyndon Johnson's fair-haired boy, but I can't stomach McGovern. I'm for Nixon. This is, this is like a great moment that doesn't happen in this era of intense partisan loyalty. And uh, Brian shows up a couple of days later in New York to give a speech, and all the honest money Democrats and Republicans call on Cochran to make a response a week later at Madison Square Garden, and he does. And I've read his speech, and it's brilliant. You can just hear. I, had a, I have one version of it in which they say applause or laughter. And you can just see why people were cheering or applauding or laughing at particular points. It's a brilliant piece of work. Without a single note, he speaks for an hour and a half. And at the end of it, the easy boss, Thomas, Thomas Platt, says, the election is over. We have won the election. Of course, they had three, four, three hard-fought hard months to go, but it was a brilliant speech. The son of his lover reads it in the London newspapers and immediately wires him says it was a magnificent address. I hope it will have a huge moral effect. Devotedly yours, Winston Spencer Churchill. In 1947, Churchill gives the uh, Iron Curtain speech, and an American admirer writes him and says, you're the greatest orator of the 20th century. And Churchill writes him back and says, no, I'm not. Everything that I learned about the use of the, human, of the English language, how to hold thousands in thrall, 
I learned at the feet of Burke Cochran. Anyway, there are characters like that everywhere, and they're really, and some of them are rascals. Uh, one of my favorites is Daniel E. Sickles. Daniel Sickles was a Union general during the war, a Democrat. He'd been a New York assemblyman and a New York congressman, and he was one of Lincoln's Democratic generals, the people that he couldn't fire. You may remember Sickles if you're a Civil War buff because on the second day of Gettysburg, he's the guy who takes his corps off of Missionary Ridge and plunges into the Devil's Den and the Peach Orchard where they're shot to pieces. He loses a leg that day. One of his subordinates said the loss of his leg was a gain to us regardless of what it was to him. He, uh, he uh, is an unusual character, but he endorses McKinley and helps rally Union veterans in what is called the, uh, which was, la was labeled, announced to be the heroic battalion tour, and the newspapers quickly dubbed it the general's tour, and they went around rallying uh, uh, northern veterans to come out and vote for the last man who fought in the Civil War uh, who, who would be president. Uh, Sickles, however, is an interesting character. When he was elected to the New York General Assembly in the early 1850s, one of the first things he did was show up on the floor of the General Assembly with a well-known prostitute in tow <laughs> who recognized some of her clients on the floor. <laughs> when he got elected to Congress, he was a bachelor and uh, proceeded. He, he made a wide swath in Washington and uh, conducting affairs left and right and became a little bit of a, a problem for him. So he got married to a 16-year-old who apparently was stunningly attractive, apparently a unbelievable beauty. But he continued to have affairs on her, so in retaliation, she took a lover of her own. Sickles found out about it, found out where they were, and burst in on them in the middle of an intimate act, and proceeded to shoot her lover dead, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Francis Scott Key, Jr and got off of the charge of murder by the first successful use of the defense of temporary insanity in the United States. But in 1896, he's stampeding around the country. Uh, he had one great rally. He stands up and he says, says uh, I would like to kick uh, Brian in the ass, but I only have one leg. And 12,000 people stood up and began mimicking, <laughs> kicking Brian in the ass. Anyway, it's a great story, and I hope you enjoy it. With that, I'll, I'll conclude and answer or duck any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, Carl's been nice enough to uh, stick around to answer your questions. We've probably got about 15 minutes. So if you've got a question, uh, raise your hand. We have uh, staff walking the aisles. And all I ask is that you wait till you get the mic in your hand uh, before you ask your question. So we'll start right over here. Carl, welcome back to California. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm Ross Porter. Last time I saw you was down at FOA. There he goes. I broadcast the Dodgers for 28 years. I remember you telling me how baseball was so important to your dad. Yeah. And he got in the car and That's drove right. around with him. That's right. I've got a, first of all, I've got to tell you that William McKinley was a fraternity brother of mine. There we go. SAE, was that it? That's right, but we were yeah. not in the same class. Yeah. <laughs> he was a little ahead of you. Carl, I want to look ahead to November. I love politics next to sports and my wife. No, man, you got it wrong. My wife first. That's Next right. to your wife that's in right. sports. 50, 54 years. So. 18 states in the last six presidential elections have voted for the Democrat. If those 18 continue that pattern in November, Hillary Clinton will have 242 electoral votes. She'll only need 28 more to be the president probably for eight years. What blue states do you see, yeah. and I know this is not news to you, because you got your little white chalkboard. Yeah. What blue states do the Republicans have to take yeah. to avoid that? Yeah, good. First of all, remember the mindset. McKinley faced the same issue. The South was solid in favor of the Democrats. The West, the Rocky Mountain West, was in open revolt because of silver against the Republicans. So he went into the election with the Democrats having an electoral college advantage. And he won the election by going after their turf. He won the border states. He won all the battleground states. The battleground states of the Gilded Age were Indiana, Ohio, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey. 
most of which, except with the exception of Ohio, had been won by the Democrats in the previous election. And he won all of them. He also, more importantly, won four of the five border states. He won Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Three of those states had, had uh, not voted for the Republicans since 1864, and one of them had never voted Republican. And he carried them. And uh, he carried... Uh, he carried the states in the Midwest that were thought to be up for grabs by taking this principled issue. I mean, Illinois had gone for the Democrats in 1892. He got it back in a big way. Uh, Iowa had gone for the Democrats. He got it back. Our candidates got to have the same mindset. So, so the first thing is you got to figure out how you're going to get there. We have to win Florida. We lost it by seven-tenths of one percent. We lose Florida, and it is virtually impossible for us to win the presidency. So we have to win Florida. We have to win Virginia, which we lost by just less than two percent, and we can do it. We have to win Ohio, which was a battleground state back then. No Republican is elected president between Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt, who was not born in Ohio. So we have to win Ohio. But then we have to win something else. Now, if I were a betting man today, I'd say our best chance for something else is Colorado. Because weird things are happening in the state that have caused it to turn. President Obama consistently since 2012 has been less popular in Colorado than he has been in the first four years in Colorado and less popular in Colorado than he is nationally. And there's something going on in that state, and, but in order to get it, we have to have a candidate who can get the Latino vote. Same with Nevada. Something's going on in Nevada that makes that state available to us. But again, 14% of the voters are Latino. Uh, Iowa is a state that could be up for grabs. New Hampshire could be up for grabs. And depending on who our nominee is, and if there's somebody on the, uh, from the Midwest on the ticket, I think that we are looking at an election where the, the, the map will look more like it did in 2000 and the upper Midwest from Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota will all be in play. You may, you may not have remember this, but we lost Wisconsin in 2000 by 5,500 votes. And there's something Hillary Clinton does not have with working class, blue collar Democrats and independents does not have the level of support she should have. But we have to have somebody who recognizes this election cannot be won by simply having people who voted for Republicans in the past. We have to get people who reluctantly voted for President Obama once or twice. I had a guy, I had breakfast this morning. I had an unusual host this morning, Ari Emanuel, Rom's brother. Who's seen the movie Entourage or the show Entourage? <laughs> that's, 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 it's based on Ari. And I had a, I, I was with David Axelrod and I was in front of the William Morris Entertainment, the William Morris agents. Let's just say this is not a typical Republican crowd. <laughs> but I got up a little early because I'm still on Texas time and I'm sitting there with the, sitting in this big tent that they have for breakfast. A guy comes up to have breakfast with me and he says, you know, I, he said, my father was angry with me because I voted for Obama in 2008. Because he said, I thought it'd be good for the country. And he said, I didn't vote for him the second time. But that's the kind of voter we need to get to. Somebody who said, I voted for him, but I'm open to something else. And a lot of those people are going to be people who are not white Republicans. Look, I come from Texas. Now, you know, how, do we have any other Texans here? Yes, you. Yeah, there we go. Everybody thinks we're sort of the redneck, you know, sort of redneck Riviera, you know. It's, we have a higher percentage in Texas of African Americans than the country as a whole. We have a higher percentage of Latinos than the nation as a whole. This will blow your minds. We have a higher percentage of Asian Americans in Texas than the nation as a whole. And we have a significantly smaller percentage of white voters than the nation as a whole, and yet we have 28 statewide elected officials, and they're all Republicans, and we have 100 out of 150 in the Texas House, 20 out of 31 in the Texas Senate, God knows how many members of the congressional delegation, two of U.S. senators, and we're a deep red state, and why? Because our Republican candidates routinely get, our governor got 50 percent of the Latino vote. Now he did so by two things. One is he put his mother-in-law in a TV ad. And she's a Latina. And people sort of suddenly said, wait a minute, that means he's married to a Latina. 
we're going to have a Latina first lady. And more importantly, people said, God dang, if he can get his mother-in-law to say nice things about him, he must be really good. <laughs> but we can do this. Now, look, something's going to happen in American politics. You can't have the instability that we've had for 20 some odd years with back and forth and divided government and close elections without it ultimately slipping one way. McKinley made it slip. And think about what happened. For the next 40 years, the next 36 years, nearly 40 years, we had more Republican governors than we had for the next 90. It took until 2011 to equal the number of governors that we had during that period of time. We controlled the White House for 28 years, the Senate for 30 out of 36 years, the House for 26 out of, out of 30 uh, at 36 years, and we would have controlled it more had we not split in 1912 among ourselves. And the mayors of most major cities in the North and West, for most of that period of time, New York, Cleveland, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, the St. Louis, San Francisco, Los Angeles, what? They were Republicans. And we have a chance, if we win this election, to create that kind of durable coalition. And I think the country's ready for it, but in order to win, in order to do it, we got to win, and we got to have somebody who can pull together that kind of coalition. How much of a factor is anger? Anger is a big factor, and, and look, people were angry in 1896. Look, people were angry in 1980. You think people were happy with double-digit inflation and double-digit interest rates and double-digit unemployment? No, they weren't. You think people were happy about the economy in 1896? We had roughly 15% unemployment as a result of the Great Depression of 1893. But you've got to have somebody who channels that anger. And you channel that anger more effectively by having an optimistic and positive vision of what it is that you want to achieve. That was Reagan's great genius, the shining city on the hill. When Reagan talked about the future, that optimism was infectious. And McKinley talked about it too. McKinley talked about the restoration of confidence. He talked about national unity. And he talked about it in a way that was incredibly powerful to people. And that's what our candidate has got to be willing to do. Fine, there's a lot of anger. There's an anger at both places. You think there's anger at the political parties today? Go back to 1896. You have the Democratic Party completely repudiates the sitting Democratic president. They literally have convention after convention after convention that passes resolutions condemning the sitting Democratic president. At the Indiana Convention in June of 1896, the, the, the invocator stands up and asks for, the, for blessings and includes in his list of blessings the president of the United States, and a delegate stands up and, and demands that he withdraw his, his words. <laughs> so there's anger, but, but, but successful politicians who win elections and then more importantly govern in a way that changes fundamentally the politics and the future of the country are people who can do so in an optimistic and positive way. We have a question right over here. Hi, Mr. Rove. It is incredible to get to hear you speak. Um, my question is, you talk a lot about the, how p parties develop and emerge and how campaigns and elections change with the climate of government. So how would you see, based on what's going on today in the climate and government today, how you see the Republican, cha Republican Party changing, if at all? Well, look, I, I, call me simple-minded, but I, I'm a conservative. And I believe that conservative ideals have universal application. They're not simply pe for you know, people like us. They're for everybody. Look, I didn't come from anything. I, I, I got to go to college. I lived on the shabby side of the, you know, the shabby underclass side of the, of the middle class growing up. I got to go to college because I got a $1,500 a year scholarship. My, my dorm room, actually my apartment, was a rented space under the eaves of, of, uh, of, of a porch. I, I slept on a, in a sleeping bag on a pad. My, my closet was a hanger. My light was one of those things you get at the auto store that have the bulb protected. By, that, was my, that was my light. And yet I got to work in the White House. So I have a belief, call it crazy, call it simple-minded, that if we have candidates who can go to every community and every part and of our country and say, I have a positive vision based on conservative principles that will make your life better, that people will respond. And you know what? I see it happen with our governors. 
Rick Scott got reelected with 25% of the African American vote in Florida. Why? Because he stood up and said, I believe your children, every child has a right to a quality education. And if that means that you have, that you, you have to go outside the public school system and, and, be, uh, and go into a charter or a, a charter school or have public school choice, I'm in favor of that. We had John Kasich get reelected as governor with that. We had, we had you know, 50% of the Latino vote because because uh, Greg Abbott went around Texas saying, I, I see a better future for our state that includes you. So I, I, I think this is really important for our candidates to have this mindset of saying, I, I have confidence that our beliefs can be conveyed to people who aren't, who aren't card carrying rock rib Republicans and make sense with them. Think about this. Mitt Romney got 27% of the Latino vote nationwide. George W. Bush got 44% in 2004. In the seven battleground states with exit polling, Mitt Romney got 33%. And in the battleground of battlegrounds, Ohio, Mitt Romney got 43%. Now, why is that? Because if you're a Latino in California or Texas or New York, you never saw him up close. All you knew was self-deportation. But if you were a Latino in Ohio, I mean, if you're running for president, it's like running for governor of Ohio. You keep some spare change of you know, clothes at the Hilton in Cleveland. You know, you go to Lima twice. You know, you go to, you know, you go to, to every one of those 66 counties. You know, you, can, you, can, you, you know where the best Dairy Queen is in each one of them. <laughs> and what happened is, is Latinos in Ohio heard enough of Romney and saw him up close enough that they said, you know what, this guy's going to create jobs and make for a better future. He'll be a good leader. So he got 43. Whereas those that didn't see him up close and didn't hear him like you would in Ohio, he got 27. So I, 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 I think this is really important for our candidates to, to do. We have time for one last question right here. No pressure, but it better be a good one. <laughs> All right, Mr. Rowe, very uh, been fascinating to listen to you, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Was there anything that you discovered while researching the book that really just, I hate to use the term blew your mind, but just was so amazing? You said, wow, that's just, I never expected that. And also, a little bit about the, camp, the difference in the two campaigns, because I know they were vastly different uh, in terms of what McKinley and Brian did on the campaign yeah. trail. Yeah, well, the biggest difference between the two campaigns is seen from the surface, and that is, Brian got on a train and traveled around the country. He traveled 18,000 miles and gave literally hundreds of speeches and was seen by two to three million people. And McKinley did the famous front porch campaign. He realized that if he went on the road, he, <clears throat> Hannah wanted him to go on the road because they were very nervous. They were losing the election. And so they said, you need to go on the road. And he told Hannah, I can't do that. So Hannah sends one of his close friends, one of McKinley's close friends, Myron T. Herrick to, to talk to him. He says, I, I can't do that. If, 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 I go, if, if I go on the road, I'm going to have to match him. And if I, if I ride in, if I, if I ride in a, in a private, in a private car, he'll ride it in a public car. And if I ride in a public car, he'll ride in a freight car. <laughs> and, and, uh, so they send another, he sends Dawes to talk to him. And he says to Dawes, no, no, look, I, I'll be, you know, I'll be like the man on the trapeze. You know, he'll, he'll do something, he'll pull a stunt, and I'll have to beat it. And he says, besides, I need to think before I speak. So the, the, the principal difference was that. But, the, but an even more important difference is, is that McKinley runs the first modern presidential campaign. It is incredibly well organized. They know exactly who they're going after. They understand what they need to say. They print 250 million pieces of literature, 18 pieces of literature for every single voter. And remember, they're not spending a lot of time in the Deep South where the Republican vote has been wiped out by fraud, violence, and intimidation. So that's a lot of pieces of literature. They identify 5 million households that they, want, that they think are swing voters. You know how they identify them? They don't conduct a poll. They didn't have polls back then. They had what was called a canvas. You know what the canvas was? 
Every precinct chairman was responsible for reporting, identifying and reporting the attitude of every single voter in their precinct, reporting it to the county, which reported it to the state. So from that list, they picked out five million doubtful Republican voters and had a hundred women in Chicago every week put together a packet of material, address the envelope, stamp it and mail it to five million households. They organized every group. They had the, that literature was printed in 18 different languages. And they had a group for every one of those. In fact, they had, uh, they had the Germans, and they had the Jews, and they had the Swedes, and they had the Norwegians, and they had you name it. They had the traveling salesman. They called them the commercial club because the traveling salesman was prevalent back then, and these guys knew everybody, were good talkers, and were traveling all the time, so they organized them. They organized young men who were active in a craze that was sweeping the country. This craze was, there's a new thing out there, a newfangled thing, and young men in particular were adapting this dramatically, and it was just a, like a wild craze across the country. It was called the bicycle. <laughs> and they organized the wheelmen. And, and literally, there's this great moment in the campaign in which the wheelmen come to Canton, and there is a day of bicyclists riding through Canton, including a band that plays its instruments while they're riding on the bicycle. <laughs> and they have elaborate parades and demonstrations for the major, and literally tens of thousands of bicyclists come to Canton. But there was a place for everybody in the campaign, and it's the first modern presidential campaign. But you asked me um, and a good final question, which was, were there things that blew my mind? And I got, I got to tell you, that phrase blew my mind? Absolutely. William McKinley himself. Think about this. We honor JFK for PT-109. We honor Bob Dole for charging onto the beach at Anzio and being badly wounded. We, we honor 41 for enlisting at the age of 18 and becoming the youngest Navy pilot in World War II. William McKinley enters the Civil War in April of 1861 as a private. He and the Poland militia, a group of young men from Poland, uh, Ohio, who have been, they, they literally the, they have been moved by a speech given by a lawyer standing on a saloon steps in Poland, Ohio, and they have shown up at Camp Jackson outside of Columbus, Ohio in April of 1861 because uh, President Lincoln has called for 90-day volunteers. And they show up and are told, all of the 90-day uh, quota has been filled. So your choice is as follows. You can enlist for three years or the duration, whichever is longer, or you can go home. And almost to a man, the Poland militia entered the service of the United States in April of 1861, and Private William McKinley is among them. And they entered the 23rd Ohio. He, he ends the war four years later after three battlefield promotions for valor as Major McKinley. And for the rest of his life as a congressman, governor, and president, he preferred to be called Major McKinley. He said, I don't know about those other titles, but I earned that one. And what blew my mind was how he earned it. He undertook two suicide missions. The first one he devised for himself. It's the bloodiest day of the war, September 1862, Antietam. He's a commissary sergeant, comfortably behind the front lines, and the 23rd Ohio goes into battle at 2 a.m. in the morning, not having been fed breakfast. They fight until 2 p.m. in the afternoon, at which point they have, covered, they have captured the Stone Bridge. Those of you who are Civil War buffs have seen the picture at Antietam of the Stone Bridge. They have fought their way over the Stone Bridge, taking terrible casualties, and are now sheltered in the early afternoon underneath a bluff. And McKinley has watched this from the safety of the back, of the, of the back uh, lines. The supply train finally shows up. And McKinley is gravely concerned that his comrades have not had food or water all day. So he gets stragglers, finds a wagon, gets stragglers, loads the wagon with coffee in giant tins, boiled meat, whatever the hell that is, and hardtack, and begin to make his way to the front lines through a forest, through a wooded area. An officer comes up and says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm going forward to supply, resupply the 23rd Ohio. And he says, no, you're not. You will have to cross seven or 800 open yards 
and the only thing in those fields are dead men because it is raked by Confederate fire from a ridge, musket and cannon fire, turn around. And McKinley says, well, I can't turn around here. I'll have to go forward to find a wider place in the road. He has no intention of turning around. He gets closer to the edge of the force, and a second officer with some aides comes rumbling up on horses. Again, same exchange. What are you doing? He explains. They says, he says, the officer says, I order you to turn around, and then makes the mistake of riding off. McKinley waits until he's comfortably out of sight and then whips the horses and comes boring out of the tree line as fast as he can and all hell breaks loose. Every Confederate musket and every Confederate cannon on the ridge line opens up and McKinley at one point the back of the wagon is blown off by a cannonball. But somehow or another McKinley makes it through the killing field and over the stone bridge and I wish I could have been there to watch it because Eyewitnesses say the 23rd Ohio stood as one and cheered the 19-year-old commissary sergeant as he came rolling across the bridge. He made his way among the gravely wounded dispensing coffee, and he gave a guy probably the last cup of coffee he ever had on this earth, and he looked up at McKinley and said, God bless the lad. And McKinley said it was the greatest reward he could have ever received. His comrades pressed for him to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he told him to stop. He said, I was only doing my duty. He was then promoted to first to uh, second lieutenant, battlefield commission from the governor of Ohio. Two years later, 1864, Battle of Kernstown, Shenandoah Valley. He's now, a, he's now turned out to be an extraordinarily able officer, and he's a staff officer to the brigade commander. And at Kernstown, the Union forces are, are across the Shenandoah Turnpike. And out of, on the Union left, out of the woods, in a surprise attack, early in the morning come Jubal Early's Confederates and begin to crumple the Union front line. And it, there, are five, there are five regiments in this particular brigade, and the brigade commander orders a retreat, but the one on the extreme right, the 13th West Virginia, is in an orchard where they can't see the advancing Confederates, and they don't get the order, and they're about ready to be cut off as the Union troops pull back, and they remain there, and they're going to be slaughtered. So the brigade commander looks around and picks McKinley, who is like a son to him, and says, I order you to ride diagonally across the battlefield in front of the Union lines and order the 13th West Virginia to withdraw before it's too late. McKinley's tent mate, Russell Hastings, later a general, said it was a suicide mission. And McKinley ran, began to ride, ride out, and again, all, it threw through unbelievable hell. I mean, this is, an act, this is a battlefield, and he is not behind the lines. He is riding in front of the lines in the, in the no man's land between the advancing Confederates and the retreating Union. A shell goes off right near his horse, and Hastings says, we thought he was dead. But he, he later wrote, but out of the gray cloud came the small brown horse with the erect horseman. McKinley was alive, makes it to the 13th West Virginia. The startled commander of the 13th West Virginia says, can we at least give him a volley before we go? They form up the 13th West Virginia, march through the orchard, and emerge on the other side. The Confederates are startled. The Union takes one a volley at them and then retreats in orderly fashion. McKinley rides into the brigade, rides behind the lines back to the brigade commander's tent, walks in the tent, and his brigade commander, Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes, <laughs> turns around and startled, looks at him and says, My God, I never expected to see you in this life again. The 23rd Ohio had in its ranks of the hundreds of, U of northern regiments, the 23rd Ohio had two future presidents and one future Supreme Court justice in its ranks. His final promotion to major came at the Battle of Winchester. You may remember the famous poet, poem about Sheridan's ride. Sheridan has been attending a meeting in Washington, makes his way back that night to Winchester, spends the night in Winchester, and, and uh, the, the, the next morning anticipates riding south to join the Union troops, wakes up in the morning to sound of distant gunfire, mounts Rienzi, his giant black horse, and begins to ride south and finds elements of the Union army in, in retreat. Once again, Jubal Early has cracked the Union line. When he arrives on the battlefield, who is the first officer that he sees? First Lieutenant William McKinley trying to organize, trying to put a battery astride the turnpike in order to pour grape shot into the advancing Confederates in a last desperate defense. McKinley conveys him to General Crooks, 
And this is the famous meeting at which Crooks and Sheridan agree. It doesn't smell like a defeat. It smells like victory. They pull together the units. George Armstrong Custer probes for a weakness in the Confederate line, finds it, and bursts through. And the Union busts Jubal Early's troops apart and ends the Confederate theater in the Shenandoah Valley for once and for all. And it was for that that McKinley has made a major. And I'm sitting there saying, my God, who would have known that this quiet, you know, unbelievably compassionate, uh, wonderful, he was a wonderful human being. Even his adversaries liked him. You, this, this also blew my mind. Not that I'm, I'm sort of going a little bit long here. I didn't know this, but in the Gilded Age, if your party lost control of Congress and you had won re-election narrowly, you were thrown out. And in 1882, McKinley wins re-election as the Republicans lose the House. He wins re-election by seven votes. And it was routine. Republicans kicked out Democrats and Democrats kicked out Republicans. So he's seated provisionally, but he knows what's going to happen. The Democrats are going to find an excuse and kick him out. And when they kick him out, something extraordinary happens. Seven Democrats, among them, his greatest adversaries on the issue of protective tariffs vote to keep him in. They vote to retain him as a mark of respect. Now, he has no chance of, of being retained because there are only seven of them. But the sen these are senior Democrats who say, no, he is a worthy adversary, and we are going to vote to retain McKinley. And this is, not, this is unheard of. It never happens. Thomas Brackett Reed once complains, one of my favorite quotes about McKinley he says, he says, my opponents in Congress go at me tooth and nail, but they always feel obliged to apologize to William before they call him names. <laughs> and that was McKinley, this unbelievably courageous but very kind and thoughtful man who was able to, uh, to, to be a partisan without being bitterly partisan and to be a, to be a, uh, a leader of his party without being obnoxious to the others. So anyway, thanks for having me here tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Just terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.